The first contemporary artist I'll be looking at is Rebecca Belmore. She's an Anishinaabe visual and mixed media artist. She um, graduated from OCAD in 1988. She has an honorary doctorate as well. Um, she has won numerous prizes and awards, including the 2016 Gershon Prize. And she was the first Aboriginal woman to be selected to represent Canada at the 2005 Venice Biennale. Um, she's very well known worldwide for her installations and performance work. So Fountain, the installation, um, the video installation piece that she brought to Venice, um, according to the, the documentary that we watched, um, sort of was this idea of bringing a fountain back to Italy, especially a place like Venice, where, um, you know, water is such an integral part of their infrastructure and such a cultural symbol um, in present day and also historically, um, sort of emphasizing the idea that, you know, how Europeans came, when they came over to North America, they brought their cultural symbols and impose them, their culture and symbols, and impose them on the First Nations people. Um, so you're sort of bringing that back and sort of creating this um, political message. Um, so the, the piece is, uh, it's, it's a bit, it's like an architectural piece in a sense, the sort of shape of it and um, the water rushing like a waterfall down with this image projecting on that is sort of orange and yellow, a fire sort of looking thing. And then at certain points it's red and it almost looks like the water is rushing into this pool of blood. And so, you know, in a lot of her pieces, there are these moral and ethical messages. And you can tell that she takes very seriously her role as an artist to, you know, articulate her experience as a First Nations woman. Um, she utilizes, um, representation of, uh, Western visual art, especially, um, referencing historical, uh, context, contextual eras such as the Victorian period or the Renaissance, um, seen in this print, um, which is the, the woman in the image is, um, or the entire image is a reference to Inger's Le Grand Odalisque. Um, and uh, you, can, you can see that, and as the, the MIA website writer writes, that she uses the body to address violence and injustice against First Nations people, especially women. A member of the Anishinaabe Nation, she affirms, my body is a place from which to address the whole notion of history and what has happened to us as Aboriginal people. And I really was drawn to this. This is at the One Gallery, um, the Raise a Flag exhibition at OCAD. And I just, it, I stared at it for a long time because it's such a visceral piece. And, you know, you can really just the scar and just that that feeling of pain you know when you're looking at it and you can tell she's she's trying to you know convey the effects of colonial violence and sort of the scars that it's left even you know to this day so this piece is a representational piece, and also she seems to have this theme, um, and it's almost this this way of using art to rebel against um, Western styles, using juxtapositions, and as Gabrielle Moser writes, which I really appreciate reading this. And she's, Gabrielle Moser is a teacher at OCAD as well, and it's just really amazing. I'm so happy I came across this article and just sort of further elaborating on the fact that, you know, her juxtapositions are concerned with 
colonial violence and they are like a mode of resistance and their impacts on the human body and they also illuminate the gradual shifts that have taken place in Belmore's practice over the past 20 years. So this this uh, older piece, which I think what Gab Gabrielle's trying to compare is just this older piece from 1987, Raising to the Cajun, which is this Victorian dress that actually Belmore wore um, when the Duke and Duchess of York um, came to visit Canada. Um, it's adorned with these sort of Wedgwood broken teacup saucers and then um, also she sort of melds together these traditional Anishinaabe ornamentations like the feathers and the beads and then the reference to um, oral traditions and you know the importance of the beaver within um, within uh, mythological stories told um, in the Anishinaabe culture uh, with the, the reference of the beaver dams and stuff of the little the things that are going on in the back. Um, this is just another example of Belmore's sort of practice of using her own abilities as an artist to um, reference just the actual effects of colonialism, especially um, on Aboriginal women and, you know, using things like the reference of the Ingers and using, you know, specifically female bodies or the the fact that it's a Victorian dress, um, you know, really highlighting the experience of the Aboriginal um, woman um, in contemporary time, but, you know, because she is drawing lines to the past, she's trying to, I think, trying to really highlight this, the still very present scarring effects of colonialism. So the next um, artist, contemporary artist I'll be looking at is Caroline Manet, who is, um, she, I, she's a Cree artist. I came across her a couple years ago at TIFF Film Festival. She is a filmmaker. She is one of the founding members of the Aboriginal Digital Arts Collective. Um, she's one of the first Canadian filmmakers selected for the 33rd Cannes Films Festival residency. She's an alumni of the Berlin and Alley Talent Camp Campus and TIFF Talent Lab. Um, she has a BA in Communications and Sociology from the University of Ottawa. And she studied um, also in Spain. I really love her work. I watched one of her movies, Roberta, and she's just, she is, she has, an excellent style. She's she's a lot of her work is highly saturated. So the filters or whatever she uses, even though it's um, she's shooting real people, it almost looks because everything it, the lines and everything looks almost so perfect. It almost looks animated and it's just very clean. Um, and then she has sort of this autourish. Uh, a tour vibe to her because her narratives aren't linear. Um, she, even in Roberta, which is m much more linear than this experimental film, which was her first, her first, uh, I believe, film, uh, one that got the most, or her, it premiered at TIFF in 2009, and she was um, very well received. This is a little bit more expressionist compared to Roberta. This, this is very much, you know, the, the very much sort of this surreal um, this surreal sort of film short film that is centered on this one character this one individual and you're sort of as a, as a viewer you're observing this one character going through this sort of dreamlike state um, with her grandmother in the background um, sort of whispering and telling her stories and sort of 
it's it's kind of um, it's kind of integrating this this idea of you know oral teachings. So it has these sort of traditional things, and it's it's very centered around the individual. So you're you're just as a viewer just witnessing sort of this the psychology of this character and and so it leads you to believe that this is sort of an introspective film piece that uh, the filmmaker that Monet is sort of you know communicating her own personal reflections of herself of her identity as um, a Cree woman and sort of you know drawing on the influence of her grandmother um, and you know you're really just seeing someone else's um, thought thought process or reflection and it, it, it has this reflexive nature which I, I, I think is one of the themes throughout a lot of Monet's work which is this idea of identity um, and she also has these other films that are very representative or observational and um, she is sort of combining a lot of the times these historical elements to her culture and um, reinterpreting them in these modern ways, um, in these really creative ways. So this film, Mobilize in 2015, which won the um, Golden Sheaf Award at Yorkton Film Festival for Best Experimental Film, um, is all old footage from the National Film Board. And the score is done by Tanya Tagak, and it combines um, once again, sort of this, the, the cuts and just the very quick cuts is sort of done in this non-linear way, which is sort of this modern style of taking this old footage and a lot of traditional Aboriginal practices like canoeing and all of these sort of like movement shots that sort of convey this narrative of like a timeline or this like constant sort of continuing history or continuing into um, just this continuing timeline of almost, you know, representing the constant sort of moving forward of um, Aboriginal um, Aboriginal history and sort of this look, the, the actual going from um, the past to now and she she has these sort of really unique takes um, and modernist abstractions um, that you see sort of injected into all of her films making these sort of hybrid representations of um, Aboriginal life not only in the past but also um, contemporary and it's it's a lot of her films are very um, altruistic because you're really just as a viewer just sort of seeing through um, her her choice of perspectives, which is not, you know, there's a very atypical to film. Her, her filmmaking is very different than, you know, like a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, mobilizes just sort of this, this consequential stream of footage and sort of a stream of consciousness, but you're always sort of moving while you're watching. Yeah, so she is just, I think, a really great up and coming filmmaker to keep an eye out for, especially just her. She's very, di all of her films are very different and they're just really excellent interpretations. Um, the next uh, sort of reinterpretations of that yeah. The next artist, the final artist I'll be looking at is Mark Igloliort. Um, he is uh, identifies as an Inuk artist. Um, he grew up in Happy Valley, Goose Bay, uh, which is a military air, air base, or at least I believe that's where he spent a lot of time and his father lived or lives. Um, he is a multidisciplinary artist, but he's, I, I believe, pretty much namely a painter and a drawer. 
Um, I actually, I know he definitely does some films too. He won the Lillian Weinberg Award in Painting and Drawing, the Reveal Indigenous Art Award, and was long-listed for the Sobe Award in 2012. He has his BFA from NCAD, his MFA from Concordia, a Bachelor of Education from Memorial University, and currently is teaching at Emily Carr. I was drawn to him because I saw him speak at the on-site gallery um, a couple months ago. These diptychs, I believe he did for his thesis, um, he, it's oil on a phone book paper, which I think most of the phone books were from Labrador, and he used them because they um, have the longevity, they disintegrate, so the paintings at this moment are, are falling apart, um, and in 10 years, uh, won't, won't exist. So obviously one of his themes is ephemerality. Um, and I think death in that sense, life and death, um, and this cycle, I think he's drawn to because he spent a lot of time in Labrador and working with the youth there and the suicide epidemic that, um, is amidst the, the youth right now um, in Labrador, which is just, he's, he touched upon that at the on-site gallery talk and, you know, just how devastating it is and how it has one of the highest rates of suicide in the world. Um, and you can see that that influences his work. I think also the, after reading um, David Balzer's article um, and just thinking about you know, his dip, the use of diptychs and just sort of the placing these images beside each other that are the same thing, but they're both a little bit different. And uh, Balzer uses the word oblique, so just a bit, you know, either slanted, just off a little bit. And um, I think this idea, you know, you can look at it and it looks very similar, this idea of sort of like deja vu or hyperbolizing by using the repetition of the, the image but then also confronting, you know, reputational art in and of itself. And this idea that, you know, you can't ever really exactly directly represent anything. And I think that that confrontation works not only aesthetically or, or criticizing or deconstructing the visual constructs of um, direct representation, but also sort of this idea of trying to, when you interpret a person, um, you know, when you see something and you try and understand it, you can never actually fully understand, you know, exactly, let's say, it, if it is a person, what they really are thinking or what they are experiencing. It's always going to be skewed or through your own lens. And I think his way of observational painting and using this sort of um, doubling style of it being you know, each being a little bit skewed from the other, I think that it, it confronts this idea of representational art or representational understanding. Um, so a lot of his work is observational and he spent his thesis, um, or has spent a lot of time in Goose Bay and was influenced by, I think, you know, the youth that he was teaching and also his father who, who he would go on hunting trips with um, and would sort of experience the Inuit culture and he talks about going to these rawhide celebrations and he sort of relates it to, it sounds like, it sounds when he's telling the story it sounds amazing because it almost sounds like this large sort of trampoline, you know, people holding it and then these uh, performers or participants getting on top of it and doing these really acrobatic things and he, he ties it into sort of you know his life of being a skateboarder and it being similar and just sort of trying you can see that he tries to integrate these urban sort of ways of life and then also you know Inuit cultural traditional um, images or and within this um, painting, 
which is oil on canvas. It's quite large. It's 91 centimeters by four meters, basically. It's at the on-site gallery right now. Um, I think it's a good example of him sort of capturing this, you know, relaxed moment of probably kids hanging out, um, the backdrop of the town, you know, this encapsulating the culture. And I love that idea of the cultural landscape. And then, you know, injecting it with this stark reality, this sort of hooded figure, um, which I believe represents, you know, death and this sort of Lot, he's sort of drawing a line, I think, to the epidemic that's that's happening right now amongst the youth and sort of bringing your awareness to this sort of sad, sad reality and just sort of, you know, asking the viewer to be reflexive um, and, you know, wonder why things have gotten this bad and, you know, what responsibility governments have, what responsibility we have to be aware um, of these realities, especially of, you know, people less fortunate, of, of people who are struggling in this sort of, in this sort of um, environment that was sort of, you know, not asked for, and it, it was inflicted, and it's, I feel like he, he is very successful at bringing this sort of subtle, but you know, effective message through his art to just sort of, sort of just sinks in with you, you know, as you're watching it. Anyways, that's my presentation. Thank you.